All right, well, welcome to class 11. This is video number two. This is gonna be the longest video, but uh, maybe the most interesting slash controversial, uh, but I hope we get some good discussion out of it on Sunday. We are gonna be looking at the idea of the new heaven and new earth, which is mentioned in Revelation chapter 21 in this video. So first, let's just read Revelation 21, one through four. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride dressed up for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne, and this is what it said. Look, God has come to dwell with humans. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or weeping or pain anymore since the first things have passed away. Things that we need to first take into account is the context of Revelation itself. So this new heaven and new earth is directly related to the idea of the old heaven and old earth fleeing from the presence of God arriving uh, in judgment back in chapter 20, verse 11. So I think that's uh, why, why we have these, this particular idea in its immediate context. The idea of the bride of the lamb uh, now being Jerusalem, uh, we're going to explore that in video number three. So check that out if, if you want to think more about those ideas. The idea of being in God's presence in his um, temple uh, forever has already been brought up in Revelation as well. So in Revelation 3 verse 12, we have that same idea uh, where the faithful will be able to live in the temple of God as a pillar in his temple forever. In Revelation 7.15, we also have this idea of those who are serving and worshiping God are it, or before him in his temple, uh, before his throne, uh, forever. Okay. The biblical context of this idea of the new heaven, new earth. So it's not a it's not a new idea that John has just invented. He's actually looking at Isaiah chapter sixty five, verse seventeen and eighteen, or seventeen through nineteen. So the context of Isaiah sixty five starts back in Isaiah sixty one, where we have this new messianic passage this is the one that jesus opens his ministry with back in luke chapter 4 and so we have this idea of the anointed one proclaiming the good news to the poor uh, and freeing captives and uh, proclaiming the year of the lord's favor now the line that jesus doesn't read uh, when he begins his ministry is in verse 2 and it says in the day of the vengeance of our god to comfort all who mourn and provide to those who grieve in Zion. So God, so Jesus, when he starts his ministry, doesn't uh, begin his ministry by focusing on the day of the Lord, uh, which is coming. Uh, instead, he chooses to focus on the year of the Lord's favor, which is the, the idea of the, um, the year of Jubilee, so the, the year that everything is, is uh, no work and um, all play. Um, it's also helpful to understand that Isaiah has Zion in mind here, and so we'll have to, to keep that in mind as we go through. Um, this continues on, and in chapter 62, we kind of refocus on Zion. Uh, it says, For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like the blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and kings your glory. And you'll be called by a new name. And so um, we have this idea that, that God is going to um, bring about um, this sort of restored relationship with uh, Zion or Jerusalem. Now we can continue down um, in chapter 63. We have this vivid image that John has already used in his revelation in the previous chapters of the garments being red from treading out the wine press. Uh, in Isaiah, he's focused on his, his wrath towards the nations which have abused 
his servants, uh, and the blood splatters his garments. Um, jo John kind of reinterprets that as Jesus' own blood, um, as he is the slain lamb, uh, and he is self-sacrificing himself on behalf of the nations. And so that's why he shows up to the battle in bloody garments. And then we have this immediate juxtaposition as well as anger towards those who are um, hurting his people and then kindness towards God's people. If we continue down through chapter 64, uh, we see this idea of uh, what's called in scripture a theophany, so an arrival of God. And uh, maybe one of the most famous theophanies is in Habakkuk chapter 3. Um, very vivid imagery there, but very similar here. Uh, when God shows up, it seems like the earth begins to unravel. So everything uh, is, is set on fire, water is boiling. Uh, and the idea is that the presence, the purity of God, the, the intense uh, heat of God's presence, uh, or something like that, um, tends, tends to um, cause everything to um, be, be uh, burned because God is, is so holy. And so um, we, we have that idea in view, which has also been explored in the book of Revelation. Uh, and we continue down in, in verse 10. Uh, we have a reflection on Jerusalem's destruction. And then uh, in 65, we have this, this strange turn towards the nation. So, so the nation of Israel has rejected God. And so it seems like he's saying that I'm going to reveal myself to those who didn't ask for me and who I didn't uh, call and give a name and I'm going to give them uh, a name and so then um, we have one more reflection on justice and it's actually talking about uh, the remnant uh, that are the remnant of faithful that are found in, in Israel God will be faithful to them and then we finally get down to this verse 65 17 see I will create new heavens and a new earth the former things will not be remembered nor will they come to mind but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. So all these ideas that John's bringing in Revelation uh, seem to be drawn from, from Isaiah, uh, from these passages in Isaiah. And I think that's no accident. John is, is reflecting on how uh, in light of who Jesus is and the persecution that his people are going through. Uh, he's trying to reimagine based on what he knows about God, what he knows about uh, God's promises about Jerusalem. And even now in this second destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, uh, what that might look like. And so John, in his reflection, thinks that um, God, you know, as, as Isaiah was reflecting on these things, uh, it seemed like things were so bad that we needed a new heaven and a new earth to, to restore um, things for, for the, those living in Jerusalem so that we could, we could um, rightly deal with the sin but also have, have some sort of new place for, for these people to live. And so it seems like uh, John is again bringing up this image for similar reasons. So uh, that's, that's where that idea comes from. This actually can be played on more if we look in uh, Hebrews 11 and 12. So Hebrews 11 and 12, um, fairly famous passage, uh, talks about faith. Uh, but the, the idea that uh, I want to focus on is the city of God. And, and so um, it talks about Abraham's faith and how he was looking forward to a city with foundations, is 11 verse 10, uh, whose architect and builder is God. And then uh, down in verse 16, it says, They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Uh, therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And then all the way in, in chapter 12, verse 22, uh, he's now addressing the, the audience directly. He says, You have come to Mount Zion. So 12, verse 22, uh, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So this idea of this, this new heavenly Jerusalem uh, is 
is present in, in Scripture. And so John, I don't think he's innovating and doing something new here. He's, he's rather reflecting on, on these concepts uh, that are present at the time and also present in the prophets. So as we think about this passage, we have to put it in, in that kind of context. Uh, additionally in view is, is a temple theology. And so uh, if we think about uh, maybe 2 Corinthians uh, 6, 16, we have this, this idea that God has, has come into uh, his people in a new way and, and that we are the temple in some sense. Uh, and then there's also the, the metaphor of Jesus being the tabernacle. He's the one who comes down and, and dwells among us. Uh, John 1, 14 and, and 14, 23. Is, is are, are both in view here and then also the, just the idea of the tabernacle itself so throughout the all of scripture that's one of God's main goals is to dwell amongst his people and so he does this in various ways uh, the tabernacle and then the temple as well in first Kings 8 uh, Solomon reflects on this idea eight, first Kings 8 27 he says uh, but will God really dwell on the earth the heavens even the highest heavens cannot contain you how much less this temple that I have built. So we have this idea of, of God's presence being special and uniquely down with Israel, but also God's presence not being able to be contained in any, in any one place. Lastly, we should consider the cultural context of all this. So the first thing is we, we notice that the sea is, is no longer present. So we talked about this three-layer cosmology uh, remember, the sea is the uh, chaotic waters, the, the underworld, the depths that are um, always kind of eroding away the land, the structure, um, creating instability, adding chaos. And so uh, having, having a, a new creation that doesn't include the sea uh, is the same, same idea as destroying the dry. Consideration for uh, the cultural ideas here that are in view is this idea of new. So in Greek, there's there's two main words that they use for for the word new. Uh, one is kainos, and so this this idea of new is what's in view here in Revelation, and it's kind of a new in quality, or a fresh in development or opportunity, not found exactly like this before. So both verse one, two, and five of chapter twenty one are all using this this word new. And that is actually uh, similar but, but different in certain ways than the word neo, neos. Uh, and so neos is kind of a new on the scene. So it's, it's something that's brand new or something new in time. Uh, and so when they talk about the new wine in Matthew 9, verse 17, uh, the new wine is neos, uh, whereas the new heaven and new earth are uh, kainos. Okay, so they're new uh, in quality. And so what this suggests, based on the word choice that he's used, is it doesn't, uh, he doesn't seem to be saying, I'm going to scrap this whole project and we're going to get a brand new earth and a brand new heaven uh, and restart, but rather that he has in mind uh, an idea of a restoration. So the, the new heaven and a new earth are going to be um, similar to the old heaven and old earth, but they'll be, they'll, they'll be made new. There, there won't be a sea. Um, Satan will be destroyed, so there, there is going to be um, a, a new quality in, in some way to these these places, uh, which I think is a, a very beautiful image of of John's uh, understanding of, of the, the 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 heavenly Jerusalem that's coming down. This this idea of a place where uh, we we need something so so radically different uh, than what we have now, uh, but we still honor the created order that, that God has put in place uh, by, by understanding that, that he thinks it's, it's good. So uh, the conclusions that I wanted to draw today. First, um, just remember that John, uh, it doesn't seem like he's building any, any sort of brand new ideas here. He's taking older ideas and he's interpreting them in light of what he knows about Jesus and what's been revealed to him. And so he's fitting all the, the Bible's existent theology and understanding of heaven and earth into the narrative structure that he's built for us. Um, the second thing is that um, I think that we need to uh, take his metaphor for what it is and try and understand it on its own terms. I know we're used to thinking about 
going to heaven after we die, um, or, or that kind of uh, idea. Uh, but here John is talking about after the, the judgment uh, of a uh, heaven and earth being remade, and Jerusalem, the holy city, God's temple, the bride, all coming down out of heaven onto earth where we can dwell with God and God can dwell with us and everything will be um, good. good. So uh, I think uh, we, we need to definitely take some time to digest this. If this is a very new idea to you, um, please don't uh, reject it outright, but consider what John is saying here. Uh, consider how I've, I've characterized it. If you have questions, uh, leave them in the comments. Um, the other thing I would say is that I think that our theologies are, have been shaped by our culture over the years. And so, you know, we have um, remnants of the Left Behind series, the late great planet Earth, Hal Lindsey, and uh, even, even kind of a Cold War or nuclear war theology in which we could imagine nuclear war destroying the Earth in a similar manner to, to what uh, seems to be described in some places in Revelation. And so we kind of thought uh, one way about things, whereas before nuclear weapons were invented, um, that wouldn't have really been an option. So... All those things uh, should, I, I hope, challenge us. Uh, let's try to understand what John is saying here so that we can put it in context and help it as uh, encouragement for us and guidance as we continue to strive toward that heavenly city. Thanks.